Walter, you don't believe in God, right? Not only do I not believe in God, I believe God does not exist. Okay, good. You're also a professor of philosophy who looks at logical arguments. Right. You have spent part of your career, small part, but a part, looking at the arguments of some pretty smart people who believe in the existence of God, right? Yeah. Yes. And as you look at these arguments, how do you analyze them? And, and, and why do smart people have arguments to believe in God? And what are some of the fallacies that you see in those arguments? Well, how do you deal with the arguments? The first thing you want to do when you deal with an argument is lay it out carefully and clearly, step by step, and try to be sympathetic. Try to really understand how the argument works and what could have led them to believe the conclusion on the basis of these premises. Because too often people just make fun of other people's arguments. Right. And maybe I'll make fun of some argument, but... Uh, I may make fun of yours. Fine, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, but you want to try to, at first to understand them as charitably as possible. And then you accuse them of a fallacy only if you can't find any other way to understand their argument. And okay. some of these fallacies are old and common. I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas gave five proofs of the existence of God, and uh, they, con they contain fallacies. Okay, well, let's give me some of the fallacies. Well, one example is what I call the fallacy of bloated conclusions. You get some premises that will yield one conclusion, which is a pretty weak conclusion, and then you bloat it up so it looks like you've really proven the existence of God. So you use the logical argument. Yes. And, and you, you have some premises which may be acceptable and they logically uh, result in, in a conclusion. Right. And so that works, but then because the conclusion is weak, you, <laughs> you add stuff to it. Right, exactly. And one example of this would be Aquinas' cosmological argument. He argues, I don't think the argument's any good, but the argument is for the conclusion that something must have created the universe. There must have been a first cause, okay? He says, therefore, God exists. Well, it doesn't follow that anything like the traditional Christian God exists. Something could have created the universe and died the next day. Yeah. You don't even know if it still exists. You don't know whether it's good. You don't know whether it's eternal. You don't know whether it's a person. Sentient in You don't anyway. know whether it's sentient or, or whether it cares a twit about you. It could have created the universe and gone on its own business and let you fend for yourself. So, you, but that wouldn't have served Aquinas' purposes, so he reaches that conclusion and bloats it up into the claim that God exists. Mm. Another example is religious experience. You know, when people have a religious experience that leads them to believe in God. But how do they know that the thing they experience is all-powerful, or all-good, or all-knowing, or good at all, for that matter? And so they bloat the conclusion up, uh, usually in line with the religious tradition that they're familiar with. What's interesting here is that you're saying that the core at this, uh, uh, of this conclusion is maybe legitimate, like, like th th there may be a first cause, or there may be this religious experience. But then when you have this little something and you want to believe, then you take that little something which may be justified and blow it up and make it seem as if what you want to occur is that same thing. Exactly. I mean, there's a reason why you bloat it up in the way that you bloat it up. <laughs> right. And that's because you want to reach this bigger conclusion. Right. Okay. Another fallacy. Um, excessive footnotes. I love the fallacy of excessive footnotes. I got the name from my colleague, Bernie Gert. Uh, and that's simply that some people, when they give these arguments, they cite authority after authority after authority. They want to say, well, you, you need to believe in the Big Bang, and once you believe in the Big Bang, then something had to cause the Big Bang, and, and that must have been God. And so they cite authority after authority about the Big Bang, and they show that they understand the physics and cite the laws, and people on you know, that everybody is going to say, oh, that's a great, Stephen J. Hawking's a wonder. People always cite Stephen J. Hawking because people like Stephen J. Hawking. And so if you cite somebody that other people like and you cite them repeatedly and other and lots of other authorities, then uh, people are going to be dragged along by your argument because they're impressed by the authority. And oftentimes you're using people who, if they knew that their argument was being used for your conclusion, would yeah. be rather mortified exactly. by it. You can even quote them, but you're usually taking those sentences out of context. So when, when these types of arguments are used, you really have to go back and carefully look at the paragraphs and chapters out of which these things were taken. Another favorite is to cite 
as an authority the atheists themselves, right? So people will say, some things are wrong, but nothing would be wrong if God didn't exist. Why, even Nietzsche said that, <laughs> right? And you'll cite an atheist as an authority, a theist will cite an atheist <laughs> as an authority for what the theist wants to say, and they go, ah, gotcha, <laughs> you know? But I don't have to agree with everything all atheists say. I mean, there's lots of atheists who said right. stupid things, and that's one of them. Well, some of them may even vote Republican. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, other arguments. Another argument is false dichotomy. People will saddle the atheist with the position, well, you must believe either this or this, but that can't be right, so we must be right. So they'll say, for example, uh, they'll say, the universe must have begin, begun either by chance or through law or through a designer. Now notice, in this case, the problem with the false dichotomy is that chance and law, first of all, it's not clear what they mean, and so, as an atheist, I go, well, I don't know which one to pick because I'm not sure what they mean by it. <laughs> but also, it's not at all clear that they're incompatible with each other. Maybe I want both. When I roll dice and it comes up seven and I win my bet, there's a sense in which that was chance. I didn't know it was going to be seven, but there's a sense in which it, it happened according to laws. If you roll your hand that way with dice that weigh that much and that speed on that type of felt, it's going to come up with that number every time because there's a law that governs it. So law and chance aren't really uh, opposites of each other, and that makes it hard to respond to the argument. They're not well enough defined to know which prong to choose. Well, oftentimes they would be joined together, and then the dichotomy would be the law chance on one side and the uh, personal Judeo-Christian God on the other. Right. And that indeed is a false dichotomy because there are innumerable explanations that are, are not either one of those. I'm right. not saying those other explanations are right or even more probable. Exactly. Some of them may be very obscure. But from a logical point of view, you have not exhausted the universe of, of possibilities at all by setting up that dichotomy. Exactly. So when, you, when someone lays out a dichotomy or a trichotomy, uh, then what you need to ask yourself is, are those really incompatible? Can't I just pick two of those and give a story? So I don't have, that one can't be enough by itself, nor can that one, but can I combine them in a way? The other thing you have to ask yourself is, is there a fourth possibility right. that they've left off the list? Yes, right, because the only way to make that argument an effective one is if you can demonstrate uh, uh, universal exhaustion so that you have covered everything and then you also to, to to really have a logical argument you have to have mutual exclusivity right so you have to have universal exhaustion so that every possibility conceivable is on your list right. or embedded within the ones on your list right. and that they are exclusive in some way so it is logically impossible for more than one to be true if right. you can do that then the argument is a valid one right Exactly. But it is I mean, almost impossible to do that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. There's some pretty good arguments of that form, but maybe not in this area. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Another fallacy is equivocation. Uh, very often, a term will be used in different ways in the course of the same argument. And you can make one step when it means one thing, uh, but then you can't make the later step. Uh, and when it means something else, you can make that later step, but then you can't make the earlier step. And so you have to look at multiple meanings of the term. For universe, for example, sometimes means just the physical universe as we experience it and what we live in. Sometimes it includes God. Sometimes it includes what happened before the Big Bang. That term gets thrown around and used in many different ways, and that creates problems in a lot of the arguments that use that concept. What are some other fallacies? Well, another very common fallacy is the straw man fallacy. You present your opponent's position as a, as a straw man, something can easily be torn up, and then you make fun of your opponent, but it's not really their position, so it's not a fair move. One example of that is when theists say that atheists must believe that nothing's really morally right or wrong, there's no objective morality. Well, atheism doesn't imply anything of the sort, but who wants to have somebody who doesn't believe that rape is wrong uh, marry their daughter? <laughs> and so uh, you're going to be able to make fun of atheists and get people to turn against atheists by ascribing to atheists a position that they don't hold. Another example of the same fallacy is with regard to, for example, the resurrection of Jesus. 
Uh, it's reported in the New Testament that three women found the tomb of Jesus empty uh, after uh, the crucifixion, after he'd been buried in the tomb. And theists will sometimes say to atheists, well, what do you think? These three women were lying? Mm -hmm. I don't want to accuse these three women of lying, so it puts me in a very difficult position. But it's not really a fair argument, because my response is, I don't know exactly what did happen. I just know I don't think he rose in, into heaven. <laughs> uh, maybe they were lying. Maybe they were deluded. Maybe somebody else took it before they showed up. I don't know. But don't saddle me with a position of accusing these women of lying. With all of these fallacies, uh, some of them emerging from what we would both consider very smart people, philosophers. Oh, yeah. Why do you think the, these occur? I think the real motivation for religious belief comes from morality. People believe that if you don't believe in God, you can't be a moral person. They want to be a moral person. And it also comes from religious experience. People really do have these religious experiences, and they don't know how to understand them in any way other than through their typical religious and theistic doctrines. So when they really want to believe something, they want to argue for a conclusion, they've already decided what conclusion they want to reach, then these arguments come along. And when people start deciding on the conclusion first and constructing the arguments later, that's when you typically get fallacies.